Hello. How do volcanic eruptions happen? Well, that's the topic we are going to look at today. If you look at it in a simple way, you could say a volcanic eruption occurs when magma is able to flow through some sort of a conduit from its source to the surface. And the source can be either a shallow magma chamber, like we see here, or a deep-seated magma reservoir, which is usually much, much larger. Now, the conduit supplying the magma to the surface is most commonly a dike, so magma-filled fracture that is close to being vertical. Here we see some dikes in southeast Iceland. Now, some of them go through the whole lava pile, like this number one, whereas others, like number two, go only partially into the lava pile and probably end somewhere on the way to the surface. Now, this is a paleo rift zone. It's a fossil rift zone, extinct, no activity there now, millions of years old. And you see also that it's uh, the lava pile is dipping uh, or inclined down here. The arrows in indicate the inclination. And the numbers from 1 to 10 are some of the dikes. So uh, the dikes, if they go to the surface, they could supply magma to eruptions. Where I take the photo here, I'm standing two kilometers, 2,000 meters inside the old rift zone. How is that possible? Through the erosion by the glaciers. So the glaciers have eroded two kilometers of the crust here, and one can see into uh, the old fossil uh, rift zone or volcanic systems. Now, the part of the dike that reaches to the surface, as we see here, in an eruption in December on the Reykjanes Peninsula, December 2023 on the Reykjanes Peninsula, it forms a volcanic fissure, of course, and eventually what we call a crater row, a crater row. And how are these crater cones formed? Well, where the fissure is unusually open, where the opening or aperture of the fissure is larger than in the surrounding areas, surrounding parts of the fissure, more magma comes to the surface. In fact, much more magma comes to the surface. And these little mountains pile up that we call crater cones. And here we see some of the most famous crater cones in Iceland. This is from the famous Lucky volcanic fissure. Lucky volcanic fissure is the, well, one of the largest volcanic fissures in Iceland. It was formed in 1783, is 27 kilometers long, and has over 140 crater cones. You see here the northeastern part of the Lackey fissure. It goes all the way under the glacier. This photo is taken in the winter here, and that photo is taken in the summer. And each of these little hills, or close to mountains, some of them, is a crater cone and was a part of the volcanic fissure where more volume came out, more magma came out per unit time because the fissure but chance was there a little bit more open than in the surroundings. In some cases, we can see a feeder dike. We can see the dike feeding, supplying magma to the crater cones. This is very well seen here in northern Iceland. I show the location here. Here is Iceland, and this is northern Iceland. Here is a very long volcanic fissure. It is, in fact, the longest one we know in Iceland, 75 kilometers long, and it's called the Sveina Randerhola Crater Row. And it was formed 8,000 years ago. And after it was formed, a big canyon formed by a glacier river cut through the volcanic fissure, so the feeder dike, the dike that supplied magma to it, can be seen. And now we look at it here, and we see the connection here between the feeder dike and this crater cone here. So we're going on the next photo, we're going to look to the north at this crater cone here and the feeder dike in the canyon. And here is the canyon. 
The canyon is nearly 100 meters deep here. There are a lot of interesting things there. I will discuss those later, uh, faults and lava flows and the columnar joints and so on. But we focus now on the feeder dike. So where the Glacier River is here, at the bottom of the canyon, the dike is around four meters thick. But when it comes close to the surface at that time, 8,000 years ago, it becomes thicker or the fissure becomes more open, whiter. And here is the spatter cone. Here is the crater cone that it formed. So here the dike is up to 13, one, three meters thick. But down here, it is only four meters thick. So this is a feeder dike, one of the best exposed feeder dikes you can see, supplying magma to a volcanic fissure that formed 8,000 years ago and has been cut through by a deep canyon of a glacier river. And occasionally we can also see how the dikes leave the magma chambers. Here is a fossil magma chamber, an acid one, as over the rocks here, called granophere, have high silica content, uh, light colored. This magma chamber, this fossil magma chamber, was located with a roof. Here is the roof at around 17, 1800 meters below the initial top of, or the surface of the volcanic zone at that time. So the wall and part of the roof of the magma chamber is seen here, and a lot of dikes are seen cut, cutting through the roof and going up into it. This one is perhaps the best exposed one, and we do not know if these dikes went to the surface because uh, the part of the volcano above the magma chamber here has been eroded away. So I showed here on a schematic way on this illustration so initially, this was the situation. Here is the magma chamber at around two kilometers depth. And from it, a lot of dikes and you could say inclined seats. And you notice that the word dike in British English is written with a Y and American English with an I or some Brits also write it with an I. And uh, we see here, this was the volcano, say eight, nine million years ago. And all this part here has been eroded by glaciers. So we are seeing this contact here between the fossil magma chamber and the roof. And we're seeing these dikes coming out. So presumably it was fed by a deep seated reservoir, but we are seeing this unique thing here that we can really look at what the magma chamber was, what it was looking uh, like uh, many millions of years ago. So this all looks very simple. A, a volcanic eruption simply happens when magma is able to, to flow from its source to the surface. But the magma, the magma field fracture, the dike, has to propagate through all these layers. And that's where the complexity comes in. Because first of all, the magma pressure here in the magma chamber must be high enough to break, to rupture the roof. And additionally, it must be high enough to allow the magma to propagate towards the surface. There are no fractures at kilometer depth of this type that are waiting for magma to come in and fill them. They cannot exist there. So let's go into that a little bit. So yes, at the surface of a rift zone, we often have very impressive so-called tension fractures or extension fractures like here. This one has an opening. This is in Thingvellirera uh, or Southwest Iceland, has an opening of 15 meters. But these fractures are always shallow. They're always shallow. They may reach perhaps well, a few hundred meters depth, uh, uh, not open like that, but just as an existing fracture. If they try to go to greater depths, say kilometers depth, they would always change into faults, to normal faults, shear fractures. And magma doesn't normally use normal faults as we come to in a moment. 
So even if fractures like these are seen at the surface, they are not, they are not available for magma at kilometers depth. So we see this better here. I've showed you this one before. Here we are in Northern Iceland uh, at 1500 meters depth in the paleo rift zone or paleo volcanic zone. And we see the dike is formed by pure opening. So it's, it's simply opening of the fracture. There is no movement up and down or sideways. It's not a shear fracture, it's just an opening, pure opening. Side by side, we see shear fractures. So if you look at these ones, there has been displacement parallel with the fracture. So if you look at this lava flow here, and where it is there inside the graben, it has pumped down. So there's a displacement here, parallel with the fracture. Whereas here, if you look at this layer here, this soil layer, you see it's in the same elevation on this side and that side, meaning when this magma filled fracture, the dike formed, it was formed simply by opening due to the magmatic pressure. So these are called extension fractures. These are called shear fractures. And nearly all dikes are pure extension fractures. Pure extension fractures. The other complexity comes in, of course, as I've indicated to you already, is that all volcanic zones, all volcanoes are layered. They're composed of many layers. And when we look at the layering, and we put on any kind of pressure in the magma chamber, we see that the stresses, the stress fields in the layers, in the layer, layers, they vary. And the stress field is indicated here by these little ticks. And the dikes, they must follow these ticks. They must follow these ticks. And you see some of the ticks are horizontal, so the dikes would here be horizontal or stop. Other ticks are vertical, elongated in a vertical direction, where the dike would then be vertical. Some are inclined, and then the dike would be inclined and form so-called inclined or cone sheets. So let's look at this illustration. There we see, if we draw some, some uh, dike paths, in A, the dike would become arrested immediately here. It cannot go any further because the ticks have become horizontal. So it would be arrested here. If we try to go further, it would have to change into a sill like we see in B. Whether or not it can do it depends on the pressure in the dike. If the pressure is high, it can go into becoming a sill like this one. But if it's low, like here in A, it just stops. If the ticks are inclined, then we get an inclined sheet like here in D. This is very similar to uh, dikes, but uh, are just inclined instead of being vertical. C, in a way, is the most interesting case because first we have a vertical dike, then we have a horizontal sill, and then following the ticks, the dike goes up to form an inclined sheet. So let's now look into the field to see if we have something similar there. Well, here we are in Tenerife. A relatively thin dike, half, half a meter thick, comes up here to a contact between two different layers. And at the contact, there's a change in the stress field, so the dike changes into a sill, a very, very thin one, only two centimeters thick here, where I've written the name sill. And then it finds a new path and becomes dike again here. So dike vertically, sill horizontally, and dike vertically again. Similarly here in Southwest Iceland, an inclined sheet, really rather than a dike, comes up here, meets a contact between stiff, so-called high Young's modulus, stiff lava flow, and softer or more compliant layer below, follows the contact as a sill for a while, and then finds a way to continue as an inclined sheet. So we see there's a lot of zigzag geometry or turns and fist in the in the paths of, of dikes. And we see it even more here 
these models I'm showing you, that's a computer models, are so-called numerical models. So we can calculate the likely stress field depending on the loading and depending on, on the, uh, the layering. So here we have alternatively stiff and soft or compliant layers. 30 layers here in the roof of the magma chamber. The chamber here is assumed to be uh, uh, circular. So we see in this case, uh, dike one, three, and five would, after some twists and turns, stop altogether, become arrested. Whereas in this model, dike two and four might possibly go to the surface and supply magma to an eruption. And I've showed you earlier in talks uh, dikes that have become arrested. I'll show you two new ones here, uh, both from Tenerife. Here's a very thin one with a maximum thickness of 0.25 meters or 25 centimeters where the lady is standing. It goes up here in a soft layer, compliant layer, and ends here. And it ends because of a stress effect of a stiff lava flow above, a few meters above it. So... Tuff is a soft or compliant layer, and lava flow is a stiff, stiff layer. And we see it even more abruptly here, again in Tenerife, where a thicker dike, uh, 80 centimeters thick, comes up here in a compliant layer here and meets with a stiff uh, rock unit, which in fact is an older intrusion. There's an inclined sheet here, and becomes arrested abruptly at the contact. So what is the situation? Well, we can repeat that most volcanic eruptions happen when a magma-driven fracture, that we call a dike, or if it's inclined, an inclined sheet, is able to propagate from the source, which can be a shallow or deep-seated magma reservoir or magma chamber, and to the surface. What makes things complex is mainly the layering. Now, if all the layers, like I show here in A, of similar properties. This is a basaltic edifice like uh, big shield volcanoes like in Hawaii. Then it's usually easier for the dike to go through because all the mechanical properties of the layers are more similar than in a stratovolcano like in B where the layers have widely different properties and the tendency for the, for the dikes to become arrested at contacts or close to contacts or change into sills is much, much greater. So what is the status then of forecasting volcanic eruptions? Well, we are making progress. And we make progress by using, of course, geological and volcanological information. And we combine, combine this information with information from physics, primarily how fluid-driven fractures propagate. So the physics of fractures and rock physics is very, very important to understand and try to make reliable forecasts of eruptions. Because even if, even if we know that uh, a magma chamber has ruptured, we can infer it, say, from seismicity. And even if we know a dike is, is propagating towards the surface, in most cases today, we still cannot forecast accurately whether or not that dike is going to go to the surface, maybe in a, in a twist along a twisted path, or is it going to end as a sill or become arrested altogether? Of course, as I mentioned earlier, if there is an existing dike already that the other dike meets and can follow, then of course the path may be easier to the surface. This, these kind of dikes we call multiple, and I discussed it in earlier in an earlier talk for you. But we are making progress, but we're still not able to forecast uh, accurately whether or not a propagating magma-filled fracture a dike is going to reach the surface in most cases. But we are working very hard on, on this problem. So with these words, I say simply, thank you very much indeed, uh, and bye-bye for now.